Thank you so very much for joining us today. I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues and co-presenters. First is Kathy Hayden, third service analyst from Mintel Menu Insights, the industry's top menu research firm. And with me also is Chef Bill Briwa, who has worked with the U.S. Potato Board on culinary seminars since 2006 and has tremendous knowledge of the various potato types. In fact, it was during those seminars that we learned that the many professional chefs that there were many professional chefs that had questions about which potatoes to use in a specific menu application. So here are the topics that we're going to cover today. We'll start out first with an overview of the U.S. Potato Board, move into some truths about potato nutrition, starches and carbs, then we'll cover the growth of potato types on menus, and then we'll wrap it up with a couple additional topics around the seven leading potato types and their usage tips, as well as Q&A. So with that, let's talk about the U.S. Potato Board and give you a quick overview. First, U.S. Potato Board is a marketing entity that represents 1,600 potato growers and handlers nationwide. Each year, 100 representatives are selected from the 36 states where potatoes are grown. The board's overall goal is to build long-term demand for U.S. potatoes, and we're doing that by educating consumers, educating chefs, and educating food manufacturers about the nutritional benefits of potatoes. We're also driving potato menu and new product innovation with those audiences by co-creating a new generation of flavorful and healthy potato items so that potatoes can play an even larger role on your menus. So finally, we serve also as an information and marketing resource to help you sell more potatoes. So when you have the time, please be sure to check out our website, www.potatogoodness.com, forward slash takes you specifically to the food service section. So in the U.S., there are, there are about 100 different potato varieties used throughout the year to consistently meet the needs of the market. All of these varieties fit into one of seven potato type categories. Russets, reds, white, yellow, specialty like purple and blue. Then there's fingerlings and petites. Now the most exciting number we have to share with you right now is our current per capita consumption number of 112 pounds per year. And that's up two pounds over previous estimates. That Increase is due to many factors, but having multiple potato types to use certainly doesn't hurt. Now, one of our most critical goals is to build awareness of the fact that potatoes are naturally nutritious. A medium 5.3 ounce potato, which is about the size of a traditional computer mouse, with the skin on, is fat, cholesterol, and sodium free. It's a good source of fiber. It's rich in vitamin C. In fact, there's 45% of your daily value of vitamin C. It's a good source of potassium. In fact, it contains more potassium than a banana. And it has just 110 calories. Now, people often refer to potatoes as a starch. And so many diets have vilified this potato for having high levels of carbs. But the truth is that carbohydrates are um, Carbohydrates are sugars, starches, and fibers, which are primary sources of energy for humans. And in fact, all fruits and vegetables contain carbohydrates. But in the kitchen, the starch content of the potato is the most significant differentiator of potato types and varieties. Potatoes with a high starch content, up to about 22%, are described as floury. They cook up more granular in appearance. They have a mealy texture, and so they really are better for dishes where the desired result should be a fluffy result, like a baked or a mashed potato. They're also really good as an ingredient where texture is useful, like gnocchi. Now, potatoes with the starch content as low as 13% are known as waxy, or a boiling potato. They're ideal for menu applications that call for creamy or smooth textured potatoes, or where you'd want your potatoes to stay firm in things like soups or stews and salads. Now one final note, potato sugars are another important variable. Potatoes are naturally low in sugar, as evidenced by their earthy taste, of course, 
but the sugar levels vary, de vary greatly depending on the variety. And this is important in preparations like frying, where excess sugars can turn the potatoes a dark color. You should feel really comfortable talking to your distributor for potatoes and asking them for ones with lower sugar levels, if that's what you want. Now, to store potatoes properly, keep them in a cool 45 to 55 degree space. Keep them dry, well ventilated, and avoid exposure to light. And with that, we'll move into the, some Mintel menu statistics. Kathy? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, yeah, first, before we move into looking at potato types on menus, I just want to explain um, menu insights a bit. Um, Mintel Menu Insight collects menus from the top 355 U.S. chains and more than 200 innovative independents, totaling more than 2,400 menu items that we update quarterly. Um, the potato usage patterns you'll see in our slides reflect total number of potato side dishes that appear in our database. And the first slide we're going to look at shows that, as you can see, potato sides have increased on menus overall nearly 12% since 2007. Casual and family mid-scale dining segments show the most usage because they offer the most types of potato dishes, fries, hash browns, mashed, um, whereas QSR seems to um, usually just have uh, some hash browns and fries. And again, the usage is strong, but the variety is a little bit more limited. Um, in fact, QSR is always a strong potato user segment, and we expect it to grow because snacking is a major phenomena in the food service industry, and many people uh, turn to fries and different fry shapes for snacks. Um, there's, and there's plenty of room for different shapes, like um, either hash browns or filled hash browns or potato tots, waffle cuts. Um, all of these have more snacking potential because they can be dipped or um, piled on top or filled. Um, fine dining is where new varietals like the purples and the fingerlings emerge. And fingerlings are um, also trickling down into some casual dining segments. Um, the next slide looks at how the different potato, potato varieties are being used and what their menu patterns are. As you can see at the top, the bumpiest line, Redskins, has more to do with how these um, potatoes have been named on menus. We see everything from Red Skin to Red to Red Bliss and Red Babies. Um, they're all on the rise, but it just means that that uh, Red Skin potato proper had a, has had a, a bit of an arc and then a decline, but it just means people are naming them differently. And in most cases, the, the more descriptive a name is, the better. Um, and a closer look at all any of the red ones shows that usage is up overall over the um, five-year time span that we look at. Um, in general, these usage patterns among potato types show a trend toward more naming of varietals, sizes, uh, regions of growing, and other descriptions that add value and menu appeal. Uh, the next slide is an even closer look at potato usage on menu. Uh, these menu examples show, show just a few ways that varietal color and other potato details are showing up on menus. The menu descriptions also support a few menu trends, like um, diner-styled hearty fare is popular right now. So we see the emergence of skillet dishes, as in the um, Texas iron skillet at the bottom, and also hash browns and very fancy um, versions of hash are emerging. Hot pies have become popular. And these are all sort of comfort food re, uh, kind of rejiggered in new ways because comfort food is, still has major appeal. Um, another trend, using potato in veggie burgers, as in the Yukon potato and white bean basil burger, um, shows that no meat entrees or, lower, or less meat entrees um, are gaining some momentum on menus. They help keep protein costs in line, and they support a bigger trend that shows more veggie options um, are emerging just because people may choose to have a, a veggie item um, one day and have meat and potatoes another day. So it's just a, a matter of having more options on the menu for everybody. Um, grab and go is important. 
especially at breakfast, which is growing um, as a menu opportunity. And more and more potatoes are being included in wraps and other portable options. So potatoes don't have to be a side dish at breakfast. Um, they add bulk and heartiness, and um, people appreciate a value-minded um, filling breakfast these days. Fine dining, again, is where you find the um, fingerlings, purple, and other emerging um, trends and lesser known varieties. So um, that is some of the menu highlights we're seeing. And at this point, I'm going to turn it to um, back to Kathleen. That's right. Thank you so much. So remember, if you have any questions about any of that data, please just write it down on the side and um, let us know what your questions are at the end of the webinar. But with that, we're ready to move into the seven types of potatoes. So here we go. The first is russets. They're the most widely used potato type in food service, and a large majority are grown in the Northwest. They're generally large, although baby russets are gaining some traction, and they're available all year long. These potatoes are high in starch and are characterized by a netted brown skin and a white flesh. Russets really do set the standard when it comes to floury potatoes. They're light and fluffy when cooked, and they have a mild, earthy flavor. You know, Kathleen, I would love to jump in here and uh, talk about using russets. This is Bill Brewa. Uh, I'm a chef instructor here at the Culinary Institute. And uh, I, I sort of maintain that when chefs think about potatoes, they're really thinking about russet potatoes. Um, they're a great potato for baking, for mashing. They're great for frying and roasting. And what I've noticed is that as consumers get more and more enamored with the, the flavors of the global kitchen, bold, lively flavors, that potatoes like the russet potato uh, provide the perfect sort of neutral canvas that can support menu innovation. You put something on the menu that features russet potatoes, and I don't think that there's a consumer out there that would ever doubt that that potato dish would be anything but familiar, comforting, and delicious. Um, I've got some interesting opportunities to me, uh, presented to me here at the school. Um, as an example, in 2012, last year, we did a, a class with the US Potato Board. And there was a grower, a russet potato grower from Idaho. And I got into a conversation with her, and I asked her if she had any insider tips about how you uh, might cook russet potatoes. And she thought for a second and said, you know, really nothing very special, and then launched into this explanation of how she bakes a potato. So I'm going to share it with you. Here's what she said. First, she said, I cut the ends off the potato, just about the size of a quarter, <clears throat> and that allows excess moisture to leave the potato as it's baking. She also said that she likes to bake it on a um, pan of rock salt to help uh, prevent burning and to get it even drier. Then when the potato is tender, when you can pierce it easily with a knife, she takes it, and before cutting into it, she drapes a clean towel over the top, and she gives it a little massage. And I said, what are you talking about? She says, I like to break up the texture of the potato. And as you squeeze it, you can feel that the interior begins to break apart. It softens under your touch. And then finally, when that's happened, she takes the towel off. And rather than just cutting a cross in the potato, she takes a fork and she sort of pierces a zigzag, zigzag pattern from one end of the potato to the other. And then finally, she gives it a squeeze. And the potato opens up. In fact, it almost explodes into a light, fluffy um, container of baked potato goodness. And it's ready for whatever you want to top it with. Um, if you're a traditionalist, it might be bacon and sour cream and maybe chives. But in the fine dining segment, <clears throat> I can imagine foie gras butter and shaved truffles and a little drizzle of port wine demi-gloss. Um, that was a technique I had never encountered before. And, and I feel really grateful that she shared it. It's a technique that you have to try yourself to really appreciate. But if you do, I can almost guarantee you will never think of baked potatoes as humble or pedestrian ever again. That's so true, Chef. I love that story. And it really is amazing what a potato farmer will tell you 
when you ask them a question, even though they think maybe, oh, everybody knows this, right? Yeah, but uh, not true. And not true. All right, so let's move on to reds. Reds are characterized by their rosy red skin color and a white flesh. They have firm, moist, and smooth texture, um, and a subtle sweetness, and a mild taste. Round reds sometimes are referred to as new potatoes. However, technically speaking, this quote-unquote new potato actually refers to any potato that's harvested before reaching maturity. When I think of new potatoes, I think of new potatoes or red potatoes uh, as the potatoes that, uh, because of their waxy makeup, stay firm and hold their shape throughout the cooking process. So for that reason, they're a really good choice for all kinds of side dishes and salads and soups where it's important to the chef that the potato stays distinct and recognizable. Uh, as an example, a little diced potato in a, a chowder or a soup, um, red potatoes would be a good choice. The thing about a, a red potato is the distinctive skin. It's fairly thin, but the color is very, very bright. And in finished dishes, what I think is that those skins lend uh, an appealing color there's an earthiness to the flavor of the skin, and there's a texture that you wouldn't get if you peeled the potato before you cook it. One thing I've noticed, uh, especially in the casual dining segment, is that red skin potatoes are becoming really popular for a version, sort of a rustic version of skin on mashed potatoes. I see it again and again. Now, uh, I wouldn't even consider mashing a red potato. Uh, or at least that's how I was taught. Uh, the concern is that if you mash them too much, they can tend to get a little bit gluey. But if you're careful and you don't overmix them, uh, you end up with a really rustic, coarse country mash that's, that's hard to beat. So l let me give you some ideas. One might be that you mash new potatoes with goat cheese and olives and basil, and you use that rustic mash to accompany a chicken breast. Uh, on the same menu, you may have grilled shrimp. And for those, you might feature mashed red bliss potatoes with andouille sausage diced up and fried, and some green onions and a little drizzle of country gravy. And possibly on the same menu, a third entree. Uh, let's say it's a thick 12-ounce New York strip steak. It's grilled medium rare. And it comes with the roasted red peppers, which are mashed to order with mascarpone cheese, with roasted garlic, parmesan, and then topped with some crispy fried capers. What, what I think uh, I notice happening is that red potatoes are breaking out of their old role as the, the go-to potato for potato salad. And they are, in fact, becoming a rising star that everybody should pay attention to. Well, we see that rising star popularity confirmed in those Mintel trend figures that we saw earlier. So definitely uh, a potato that people are becoming very comfortable with indeed. Yeah. So now on to the whites. All right, white potatoes are round and long in shape. Uh, they're medium in starch level, and they have a smooth, generally tan skin color. They're creamy and slightly dense in texture. They have a subtle, sweet flavor and are low in sugar content. And in the kitchen, it's really that creamy texture that, that I think of as a terrific benefit. Um, also, the fact that they hold up to cooking a little bit better than a russet might. If you make a gratin with a russet potato, unless you're very careful, it can tend to get a little bit soft. Uh, the delicate skins on these white potatoes uh, add just the right amount of texture, so there's no need to peel them beforehand, so you save yourself a little time there. And as I said, I really love these potatoes when I'm making scalloped potatoes or a potato gratin, just because they seem to hold their shape so much better. Now, um, this is sort of a double-edged sword here. Uh, when I make a potato gratin, I want to make sure that the starch from the potato actually interacts with the liquid and thickens it a little bit. And uh, a red potato, that wouldn't happen as readily as it does with a white. The starch thickens the cream and the cheese, and you get a finished product that just has a delicious, um, a delicious mouthfeel. Uh, another thing that, that I think is worth mentioning, 
um, if you grill white potatoes, where, where they lack in color, uh, you can make up for by cooking technique, by grilling them, and you get the beautiful golden color, but also a fuller flavor. What I do is I always blanch the potatoes first in boiling salted water. And then when they're just done, I let them cool down. And then I cut them in half and take them to the grill with a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper. Uh, here at the CIA, we teach about a, a browning reaction called the Maillard reaction, which is when you bring carbohydrates and protein, read potatoes, um, up against heat. And the reaction gives you not just the brown color or the golden color, but hundreds and hundreds of flavor and aroma compounds that have the ability to seduce even the pickiest diner. Here's an interesting idea that we do here at the school. Um, in our restaurant, the Wine Spectator Greystone Restaurant, we take the whey that's left over from having made our own ricotta cheese, and we use that whey to par cook our white potatoes. And, and what you can expect is it lends an additional buttery note to the flavor of the potato. Uh, because of the sugar in the whey, it helps them brown a little bit. But maybe the most important thing is that it gives our servers sort of a compelling flavor story to tell to customers. Last but not least, it repurposes something that otherwise might have just been discarded. And what I'm talking about there is the way. Uh, the chef of the Wine Spectator Greystone Restaurant, a guy named uh, Almir da Fonseca, really prides himself on what he calls a 110% product utilization. So not only does he, he make the cheese and get the ricotta, but he takes what's left over from having made that cheese and puts it to work um, cooking white potatoes. It's really a win-win situation where white potatoes are concerned and also where food, so food cost is concerned. OK. Well, let's keep up that win-win mentality as we, talk that. About, okay, as we talk about yellow potatoes. So yellows, are, and especially Yukon Golds, are very popular in Europe and increasingly popular in the US. Yellows come in a variety of sizes and have round to oblong shapes. They have a slightly waxy, creamy, and definitely moist texture. They're known for their faintly sweet, rich, and buttery flavor. For me, yellow potatoes are ideal for grilling. Uh, in fact, in grilling them, it gives the yellow potatoes sort of a crispy skin uh, that seems to enhance the buttery flesh inside. And uh, you end up with this almost sweet caramelized flavor. Certainly, you can roast these potatoes as well, or you can mash them. Uh, and you can even boil them and add them to salads. When I think of Yukon Golds and, and similar yellow potatoes, uh, I think of them as all-purpose potatoes. They sort of straddle the line between waxy and mealy potatoes. So they're not as waxy as red potatoes. They're not as mealy as russet potatoes. They seem to, um, they seem to be ready to do it all. This is a potato that sort of comes in through the back door of your kitchen and says, how can I help? What I've noticed is a really interesting thing, and I've, I've uh, heard this anecdotally from chef after chef. They're discovering that the creamy texture and the buttery color uh, that you see in the flesh of a Yukon Gold convinces consumers that you've added a lot more butter to that potato even when you haven't. Uh, and for that reason, uh, they're great for lighter, healthier preparations. If you look on the slide that's on the screen right now, there's a picture of a smashed potato. And I think it's worth calling out smashed potatoes. Smashed potatoes uh, are starting to become really, really popular. Uh, first, you boil the potatoes in salted water. And when they are done, you take them and you crack them. Sometimes I hit them with my palm, or I hit them with a, a little saute pan. Basically, you want to gently crush the potato to open up the insides and add some extra surface area. And that surface area can absorb flavors and, and brown very, very nicely. So uh, crack them and then roast them with herbs like oregano and garlic and a drizzle of olive oil until it's golden. Now, if you, um, if you decide that calories don't really count today and they're no concern of yours, 
then you can also taste those smashed potatoes and drop them into the deep fat fryer and fry them hot until they're crispy, at which point they make sort of what I consider to be the perfect bar snack. You can take these potatoes and dip them into a punchy salsa verde or a rich garlic mayonnaise that has saffron in it, or even a spicy romesco sauce with almonds and hazelnuts. And um, it, it sort of makes a trip to the bar that much more special. Mmm, romesco, one of my favorites. Well, everyone, um, just as a, a point of order, I have noticed as a uh, chef was speaking that there's been some uh, flicking around with the slides. And please, if for whatever reason you're not able to view the slides, um, please let the organizer know. You know. Go ahead and type in a in the chat area that um, let her know if you can't see what we're seeing. But we should be on specialty potato type slide. Um, and we're going to talk about emerging potato, especially potato types, uh, as the next section here. But I just wanted to pause a note, as shown in this slide right here, a dish of red bliss, purple Peruvians, and Yukon gold potatoes that can be colorful, uh, delicious, an appetizer uh, option, but it doesn't just have to be a side or a salad, but it can be all that if you want them to be. What's really nice about potatoes is that they have these colorful, healthful cues. Um, we have the varietal options and the familiarity to your customers. Um, and they also provide a comforting profile, which makes them an optimum canvas for any flavor innovation that you might want to try. All right, so now let's talk about blues and purples. Um, they've, they've originated from South America and are being uh, are beginning to become more and more widely cultivated in the U.S. Generally, they have a moist, firm texture, but the Peruvian varieties are much more flowery due to a higher starch content. Um, the blues and purples have an earthy, nutty flavor, and their flesh colors range from dark purple to lavender to white. You know, I, I think of these as, as versatile potatoes, kind of the way I think of Yukon Golds. Uh, you can roast them and grill them. You can bake them. You can add them into potato salads where you're looking for that little hit of uh, unexpected color. They hold their shape really well after cooking. And, and as you said, Kathleen, because of the, the pigment that gives them color, they tend to have a much fuller flavor. Um, that pigment also gives them um, sort of a higher level of protective nutrients. And if there's a downside to that color, it would simply be that the color in a purple potato, the, the pigment that gives us that purple color is water soluble. So maybe boiling in water, especially cut up, is not ideal because the color leaches out into the cooking liquid and the potatoes can look a little bit uh, anemic. Um, if you do choose to boil them, what I would say is leave the skins on until after they're cooked, and that keeps the color inside. And just a little hint of vinegar or other acid in the water will help keep that, that uh, purple color brighter. Um, when I cook these potatoes, what I usually choose to do is, is either microwave them or steam them or bake them, and that keeps the color uh, pretty firmly intact. Uh, I was pleased to hear you mention that the Peruvian version, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes is a little mealier than uh, some of the other blues that hold their shape very well. Uh, I've had exactly that experience where sometimes I get them and, and they're perfect for boiling and holding their shape, and other times they tend to be a little bit mealier. What I would say is just talk to your purveyors and ask them if the purple potatoes that they currently have on offer are waxy or mealy, because as I said, I've enjoyed both styles. What I like to do, and this is a great way of holding on to the color of this potato, is bury them in rock salt and roast them until they're tender. And what you'll notice is that they take on this wonderful salty haze on the outside. And then I dig the potatoes out, and I cut them uh, the way I might cut a baked potato. And I squeeze it open, and I serve it as a fun cheese course topped with a triple cream cheese, something like brie or brie ad saberan, 
uh, just a few drops of truffle oil and a healthy grind of uh, freshly ground black pepper. And uh, as a part of a, um, a fancier meal where you want to include a cheese course, uh, it's really a great idea. Also, at the beginning of a meal, as an appetizer, it's kind of a fun, uh, a fun idea to put on your menu. Well, if that sounds absolutely scrumptious to you, I can tell you that it is. I had the pleasure of having um, Chef create those purples in that fashion for a function at the CIA, and they were amazing. All right, so next up, fun and fantastic fingerlings. Fingerlings are firm, waxy, and flavorful. Their small, uh, slender potatoes are about four inches long and about the shape of your finger. Uh, the varieties are grown in an array of colors with reds, oranges, purples, yellows, or white, uh, or white skin, especially in the flesh as well as in, in the skin that you see. Uh, the flavors also run a huge gamut, uh, but generally reflective of their larger co-parts. For me, there's nothing better than fingerlings that are either pan-fried or oven-roasted. Uh, they both are cooking techniques that seem to enhance their flavor. Um, what I like to do is mix and match fingerlings with other baby vegetables. And uh, with that selection of produce, I can compose eye-catching small plates or vegetable sides or, or even composed salads. Visually, it seems like uh, fingerling potatoes really make dishes more special, uh, kind of more compelling. You know, they arrive at the table and people seem to perk up. I like them roasted. And uh, if you're looking for a healthy option to the French fry, I think a roasted fingerling potato is a great idea. You can uh, serve them with a variety of dipping sauces, you know, something like a house-made mango ketchup or a smoky, spicy barbecue sauce, or even a fiery sriracha mayo and uh, a little stack of fingerling potatoes, nice and crisp and golden, all different colors, is really um, something that catches your attention. I also like to par-cook the potatoes in salted water, and then when they're uh, done, cut them in half lengthwise and press a sage leaf onto the cut surface before I pan fry those potatoes in clarified butter. The results are crisp and golden. They're aromatic with the flavor of the sage. And uh, whenever I've had them on a menu, it's hard to make them fast enough because I put them on the menu as tattooed potatoes. And you know, who in their right mind could resist ordering a side of tattooed potatoes? One last tip. As gluten becomes a big issue for many diners, or, or more accurately, gluten intolerance, I've uh, notice that chefs are using warm roasted fingerling potatoes as a gluten-free alternative to croutons in a Caesar salad. So with the addition of grilled chicken, you can take a Caesar salad and really turn it into a satisfying meal. OK. Well, our seventh and final type of potato is the petite, petite potato which share the same appearance and texture traits as their bigger versions of the same potatoes. The only difference is that the flavor of petites tend to be more concentrated, which is why they're a great choice for salads, sides, and snacks. Some chefs even use them as a gluten-free substitute for pasta. You know, when I'm in a rush, Kathleen, it's a really easy thing to take some of these petite potatoes toss them in olive oil, rosemary, salt, and pepper, and just roast them whole. And because of their size, they roast very quickly. There's no slicing. There's no dicing. You just roast them the way they come from the case. And not only are they colorful, but you'd have to agree they're sort of irresistibly cute. Kids just go crazy for these little potatoes. One thing that, that I love to do with them as well um, is a recipe from Oaxaca. In Oaxaca, college students are very, very fond of pickled marble potatoes with chipotle chilies. Uh, first, you take the potatoes and you boil them in salted water. And when they're tender, you let them cool down. And then you peel them. And you put them into a spicy pickling liquid. It's got oregano, 
It's got allspice, cloves, and chipotles, as well as vinegar, obviously. And you let them sit even for you know, 10, 12 hours, and you taste them. They are absolutely addictive. Uh, as an example, one of the uh, faculty members here came to me the other day and said, I need that recipe. Because he was going to a, a party over the weekend, and those pickled potatoes were going to share the table with a Swiss raclette, sort of a Swiss fondue, for a, a globe-trotting Super Bowl Sunday meal. If you make them, what you'll discover is that they go very quickly. They're really, really popular. But if you make enough, they will keep indefinitely in the refrigerator. So give it a try. Wow, I tell you, I will. And uh, I'm glad that we're still in the lunch hour, because I definitely think I'm headed out to have some, uh, have uh, a nice lunch with uh, potatoes for sure. Well, actually, that, that concludes our program. So I'd like to now open the floor for any questions. And if not a question, also feel free to ask for new menu ideas if you'd like to. At this time, we're not showing any questions in the chat. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask today um, to any of our panelists, please feel free to enter them into the chat section of the dashboard for your GoToWebinar. An animal comes along and eats that potato, there's going to be a problem. There'll be no new potato that comes from it. So um, the green color is from chlorophyll, but it goes hand in hand with a compound called solanine, which is pretty toxic. And it's a protective device that potatoes have developed. Um, so if you have potatoes that have turned green, um, make sure to pare the green away. Usually the solanine is in the top sixteenth of an inch, sort of three millimeters. And the way to prevent it is just to keep your potatoes in the dark. You know, cover them with a towel or a burlap bag or keep them in a dark pantry and you'll be fine. What do you think there are good ways to um, prep potatoes ahead of time, Chef? Well, one of your big challenges, obviously, is that uh, potatoes have enzymes in them that will cause them to turn dark if they're exposed to air. Uh, they'll oxidize. So you've got a couple of options. One would be that once they're uh, cut up, you uh, find a way to cook them right away. And cooking even to low temperatures will destroy those enzymes and prevent them from from browning. Um, these days, it seems like everybody and their brother has a cryovac machine, and they've fallen in love with sous vide. And so uh, you can prevent the oxidation of potatoes by putting them into bags and drawing all of the ox oxygen out of that bag before you seal it. Uh, what I've had really good luck with is to take potatoes, peel them, put them into the bag along with some garlic and olive oil and fresh herbs, and then uh, draw a vacuum on that bag and seal it, and put it into a water bath and cook it very, very gently until the potatoes are cooked. And then I leave them in the bag, and it seems like the vacuum drives the flavor of the, the oil and the herbs and the garlic directly into the flesh of the potato. And when you finally open it up, it's almost like uh, a confit, you know, like a, a duck leg that's been cooked in its own fat, save for the fact that it's a potato that is just brimming with flavor, which I think of as a, a great little trick. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those, um, you know, those great tips and insights. Um, and I believe that concludes our webinar for today. Um, and again, we encourage you to reach out to us um, at the information shown here, either via potatogoodness.com or um, if you'd like to send any questions, um, feel free to send them to Kathleen True. And we look forward to hearing more. Goodbye, all. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.